So we had some very good news in the last video. If you hand me a finite collection of open sets, you could hand me 1.5 billion open sets. And I could take that gigantic finite collection and take the union of all 1.5 billion of them. And that union would be an open set. Same thing with intersection. I could take the intersection of all one and a half billion open, set, uh, open sets and get an open set in the process. So what we're trying to do now is figure out whether we can take that understanding from the realm of the finite collection of open sets into realms of infinite collections of open sets. Let's figure out whether and how that that's possible. So where we left off, we proved that the union of any finite collection of open sets is going to again be an open set. And same thing with the intersection of any finite collection of open sets will remain an open set. So what about an infinite collection? I've sort of sketched this out here as though we have a countably infinite collection, but really the notions that we're using here are not going to depend on any particular size of infinity. Um, it's just going to depend on whether we don't have a finite number. Is it possible that the union of an infinite collection of open sets must be open? Is it possible that the intersection of an infinite collection of open sets must be open. So to figure this out, let's sort of retrace parts of the proof from the previous video when we proved that the union of two sets, uh, two open sets was open, and when we proved that the intersection of two open sets was open. Let's retrace those arguments and see if those arguments can persist through a transition from the finite to the infinite. So let me pick an x that belongs to the infinite union, the union of all infinitely many of my open sets, and figure out whether that x must be an interior point to that union. Well, to belong to the union of a collection of, subset, of sets means that I must belong to at least one of those sets. So there exists some i for which x belongs to the ith member of my collection. So x belongs to a sub i. And because each of my a sub i's is an open set, that means that x must have been interior to a sub i. And so that must mean that there is some epsilon neighborhood around x for a positive value of epsilon, such that that epsilon neighborhood is entirely a subset of a sub i. But if the epsilon neighborhood around x is entirely a subset of a sub i, that means, and this is the key, that a sub i being a subset of the union of all of the a's, right, because every set in a collection is going to be a subset by definition of the union of that collection. That must mean also that my epsilon neighborhood is a subset of the infinite union. And because my epsilon neighborhood is a subset of that infinite union, there really is power in unions after all. That must mean that x is an interior point of the infinite union. So reading this from beginning to end, you give me any point in the infinite union of my collection of open sets, I have proven that that point must be an interior point of that infinite union. Therefore, this infinite union is again an open set. So this is the really, really good news of this video, right? That no matter how large of a collection of open sets you give me, even if that collection is infinite, even if it's so badly infinite that it's not even countable, it's not even uncountable, maybe it has cardinality Aleph 16, you know, some gigantic collection of open sets. I can take the union of that gigantic collection and be guaranteed that that union is also open. Wouldn't it be great if the same were true for intersections? Unfortunately, we're about to find out that it's not. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to not bury the lead here. It's not going to necessarily be true that the intersection of infinitely many open sets remains open. And to see why, let's step back through the proof that we did for uh, intersection of two open sets and figure out where our argument breaks down. Because our argument didn't break down for unions. We just followed our same argument all the way through. So let's start by taking a, an arbitrary point in the intersection of infinitely many open sets. What is that going to mean? Well, that means, by definition of intersection, that my point belongs to every single one of the sets in my collection. Right? That's what intersection means. But then that also means that my point is an interior point of every single one of the sets in my collection, right? Because each one of the sets in my collection was open, that means that all of the elements in each of those sets was interior to that set. Therefore, my x is interior to every one of the sets in my collection. And so what that means, remember the definition of interior point means that there exists an epsilon neighborhood around me, which is entirely a subset of the open set in which I reside. 
And so if I'm interior to every single one of the A sub I's, that means that there's going to be an epsilon ball around me that's interior to each one of the A sub I's. But those epsilon balls might all be a little bit different, right? I might have a smaller epsilon ball for one of the A sub I's, a bigger epsilon ball where I have more breathing room for one of the other A sub I's, right? So I'm getting a ball for each I in this set. And that's kind of what ends up ruining our argument, as we'll see. So it means that there exists some epsilon sub i, which is positive, such that the epsilon sub i ball around x is entirely a subset of a sub i. So the idea in our proof when we did it for two sets, when we did it for, for two sets, we had two balls, an epsilon one ball and an epsilon two ball, and we just said, let's take the smaller ball of those two. That smaller ball would be guaranteed to be in the intersection. So it would be great if we could just do the same thing for our infinite collection. Let's just take the smallest of all of the epsilon sub i's. Let's let epsilon be the minimum of epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3, however many epsilons I have. In this case, it's infinitely many. Just take the smallest one of that infinite collection of epsilons. You might see already where we're about to break down. But if we're following the argument we did before, epsilon is less than or equal to all of my epsilon sub i's. And therefore, my epsilon ball is a subset of all of the epsilon sub i balls. And that means, therefore, that because each of these epsilon sub i balls is a subset of its corresponding a sub i, the fact that the epsilon ball is a subset of a sub i for all i means, by definition, that the epsilon ball is a subset of the intersection of infinitely many sets. So x is interior to the infinite intersection. Therefore, the infinite intersection is an open set, right? Well, I've already spoiled the surprise, but we have to understand why <laughs> it should be a surprise here. So what could possibly have gone wrong? Well, here's an example that I think helps to illustrate why things can go wrong with the intersection of infinitely many open sets that didn't go wrong for the union of infinitely many open sets. So let's take the intersection of the collection of open intervals whose endpoints are minus 1 over n and positive 1 over n. So the first one of these sets is the open interval from minus 1 to 1, and then it's minus a half to a half, then it's minus a third to a third, minus a fourth to a fourth. So those are all the sets in my collection. I'm going to take the intersection of all infinitely many of those right, and try to characterize what that intersection is. What points do all of these intervals have in common? Right? That's what the infinite intersection means. Well, there's only one point, it turns out that all of those intervals have in common, and it's the number zero. Right? Zero is the only uh, number which is an, uh, an element of every single one of the open intervals of the form minus one over n to one over n for n from one to infinity. So the infinite intersection consists only of a single point, namely, it's the number zero. And I think we can pretty easily convince ourselves that the set which has only a single element is not going to be an open set because this point happens to be isolated, if you like, right? There is no epsilon neighborhood. If I stand at zero, I can't have an epsilon neighborhood around me for any positive value of epsilon, which is entirely contained within the set whose only element is zero. So all of these purple members here, uh, they're, they're all open intervals, members of this collection. Those are all open sets. But when I intersect all infinitely many of them together, the result is no longer open. So why is that allowed to happen, right? How is it possible, based on the argument that we made here, for the intersection of those infinitely many open sets not to be open? This one example already shows us that we're not going to be able to say that the intersection of any finite number of open sets, or sorry, any infinite number of open sets is open in general, right? It might not hold if our collection is infinite. So what happened here? Well, again, the problem was that we had different epsilon balls for each of my different infinitely many sets in this collection. So, Zero was an interior point of a sub one, because, for example, we could choose uh, an epsilon one ball of radius one half that entirely is a subset of a sub one. If I apply the same logic for the set a sub two, I can get a different epsilon ball, maybe with a radius of one third. Maybe my next epsilon ball has a radius of one fourth, and so on and so on. My epsilon i, my ith epsilon ball, has a radius one over i plus one, for example. Right. So I'm taking a bunch of different radii, a bunch of different positive epsilons that characterize the radii of the epsilon balls that make me the interior and interior point to each of my sets a sub i. But when I go to try to take the smallest epsilon ball, I'm asking the question, what is the smallest number among 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, 1 fifth, 1 sixth, 1 seventh, 1 eighth, dot, 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 dot. All infinitely many unit fractions. What's the smallest unit fraction? 
Well, there is no smallest unit fraction, right? There is in fact no minimum for that set <laughs> at all because we can always get smaller and smaller and smaller arbitrarily. This set does not even have a positive lower bound. In fact, the greatest lower bound for this set of epsilon radii is zero. So even if we replace minimum here with something you know more permissive like infimum, that infimum would be equal to zero. And the problem is we can't have a ball whose radius is zero, right? That's the, the one ball that we know for sure is not even a ball, right? So the smallest ball isn't even a ball. Right? The smallest epsilon here is epsilon equals zero and we can't build an epsilon neighborhood out of epsilon equals zero. That's a non-starter. So that's how it was in this example that we did not get an interior point using the same argument that we use for finitely many radii we cannot take that same argument and apply it to infinitely many of these epsilon radii. Because if we do that, we run the risk that that infimum here could actually not be a positive number anymore.